really great to see you all. Today's theme is Dream Vacation Destination, and I can't wait to hear what our Toastmaster has to share about it. When I asked her what is her dream vacation destination, she said that it would be to go to a tropical rainforest to see dancing macaws. And I think it comes from a cartoon that I have yet to see. But I think that's such a great specific dream to have that I have no doubt you'll fulfill it very soon. So please help me welcome up our Toastmaster for today, Ashwini Kanada. Good afternoon, fellow Toastmasters. Thank you, Madam Christine. Dream. Dream is a state where we are not bound by any limitations. There's no limit to what we can think of. It's just a very happy state. And vacation, it's the best time in your life. Who would not want to go on a vacation? And don't we all have dreams of going on a vacation? Yes. So let's see what all our participants today think of their dream vacation. So let's move on to the first part of the meeting. I'd like to introduce our general evaluator for today, Anjana Bachu. She'll be going through the proceedings of the meeting and she'll share her evaluation towards the end of the meeting. Anjana Bachu. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. My role today is to evaluate the meeting from start to finish and then give a final report at the end of it. I have three helpers for me to give a better evaluation. So first is our counter and uh, Shilpa. Could you please help us uh, by uh, giving the details of your role? Sure. So hello to fellow Toastmasters. I'm Shilpa. I'm going to be your our counter evaluator today. So I'm going to be looking for overused words, uh, filler words, long pauses, uh, any use of ah, uh, um. So those are the words I'm going to be looking for and uh, giving an evaluation at the end of the meeting. Grammarian of the day uh, is Ali. He will be giving us the word of the day as well. Could you please uh, describe your role? Sure. As a grammarian, I've selected word of the day. It's uh, scrupulous. It means very careful. Example usage of that would be only scrupulous grammarian can find mistakes when uh, you know intelligent speakers talk. <laughs> would be one example. Another responsibility that I have for today is to give feedbacks on use of English when people talk. That's all. Thank you, Ali. Our timer for today is Daniel. So Shankar will be the timer for today, and he'll help us uh, by describing his role. This is Shankar Vitero. Today I'm going to say a time order. So, basically, it's, uh, I'll, uh, there is a time 5 to 6 minutes, table talk is 1 to 2 minutes. If it is within the time, I can show green. If it is going to uh, lapse your time, I'll show the yellow. If it's already crossed the time, I'll show red. That means you have to come to your exit. Thank you, Shankar. proceed with our meeting and I'll be scrupulous in uh, evaluating today's meeting and I'll welcome back Ashwini at this Thank you, Anjana. Now moving on to the next part of our meeting is for the prepared speeches. We have two speakers today. Our first speaker is going to be Nagesh. Nagesh is presenting his second project, uh, Organizing Your Speech, and the speech title is Keeping Pesticides at Bay. And when I asked Nagesh what his dream vacation was, he plans to go explore all parts in North India. Let's invite uh, Nagesh for his speech. Good afternoon, Madam President and fellow Toastmasters. <coughs> Today, I chose a topic for my second speech, Keep Pesticides at Bay. So I particularly chose this topic uh, because of the recent uh, references uh, which happened for banned Indian green chilies, the US government banned Indian green chilies. So the reason is, uh, the Indian green chilies, which we, the US import, uh, is coming from the tropical countries like Mexico, Jamaica, and Dominic Republic countries. 
So we should, they can grow the inhibitory grain chilies. So they're uh, using the banned chemicals, which America banned the green, inhibitory green chilies they imported from the, this country. So before we go deep into the topic, I choose all the references based on Indian agriculture farming. So for example, okay, in India, the farming is basically it is natural farming uh, since before 1965. So after 1965, what happened? Uh, they introduced the Green Revolution. Dr. Swaminathan introduced the Green Revolution. So which in uh, farmers try to use more fertilizers, more pesticides to increase the yield and uh, satisfy the Indian Indian people's needs for food, food and uh, so in this process, so we start using chemicals and pesticides and all fertilizers or whatever. So slowly our soil strength is reduced and slowly we start using more and more pesticides which indirectly goes into the people, uh, spoil the people's health. For example, uh, one reference I can give. So initially we used to have a sugar, normal sugar. So to satisfy the demands of American, uh, American people, they introduced corn syrup. In nature, nature gave everything in a composition, proper composition. For example, you can get a corn, you can get you can get sweet also. But they are extracting only a particular component, the sweet component from the corn. Obviously, the, we are breaking the nature's rule, and we are trying to discover a new item, a new components, which will indirectly uh, spoiling the people's health. So, corn syrup is not not really good uh, good for health, but we're still using it. So if we go with the Indian farming system, so initially they, in 1965, they used to, buffaloes, cows, they are part of farming. Slowly people become lazy and it's very difficult to maintain, so they give up all the buffaloes and cows and they separated from the farming. Slowly they start to introduce all the chemical fertilizers. Now their soil is gone, their soil is dead almost, so no, no crop is coming properly without applying more and more fertilizers. And I heard a reference from in one of the TV programs. So before they are going to take a crop to the market tomorrow, so one day before they apply all the pesticides to save the crop from the, from the pests. So finally what is happening? So the people who are going to eat tomorrow from the market, getting the, all the vegetables and the fruits from the market tomorrow, they are directly uh, getting all the pesticides on the fruits. They are going to consume that, which they are going to spoil the health. So normal in India, we can see a lot of issues with the knee pains, joint pains, and migraines, headaches. These are all the direct impacts of using uh, consuming all the pesticides through fruits and vegetables. So. to minimize the topic uh, within the time. So how to uh, eradicate this situation? Now the, the people start coming up with organic farming. So in India, we, we have organic farming too, but the price is little higher than the regular, uh, regular uh, products. So what we can do? So if we, if we are not encouraging organic farming, if we go for a cheaper products, which they are using all the chemicals and pesticides, slowly, People' health is going to be down, and they are going to face a lot of problems. So, in in the okay, coming to the point, how to eradicate these problems? So, so I, I I also saw one or another TV program, which one scientist they this uh, nature zero budget for me. They are with local cow local desi cow in India, you can, you can, you cannot, you don't need to apply the chemicals and fertilizers. You can grow crop for 30 acres. It is very interesting and very surprising to hear with one local cow, local desi cow, so you can, you can, uh, you can plant a crop for 30 acres, you can sufficiently supply all the chemical, uh, all the fertilizers required through nature. So if you follow this, so we can slowly reduce all the chemical farming. So people get better health and get less problem with the health and all the long-term uh, problems. So my in my conclusion, so start encouraging the organic farming products. 
So uh, that way the farmers also start start to go with the organic farming instead of chemical farming. That way we can get a better society and a healthy, healthy society. Along with his family, he'd like to board a private yacht in San Francisco and go for a round trip that would take several years. Please welcome Tom for his second speech uh, from the Storytelling Manual. And the title of the speech is A Giant A Man. A Giant of a Man. As children, many of us are familiar with the story about Paul Bunyan. He was a huge man. He was about this tall. He was a lumberjack. He carried an axe, and with one swing of that axe, he could knock down a tree. He was a giant of a man. I also knew a giant of a man. He stood six feet tall. He weighed 225 pounds. And he had the physique of a middle linebacker on a football team. He was just as mean and tough. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry, apologies, I'm sorry. He also had a very tough mental state. He was able to intimidate people. He was also a very kind, gentle man. He was very humble. He never bragged about what he had, what he was, or what he was doing. He also liked to avoid confrontation when possible. But when he was confronted, I saw firsthand. It was never good for the other guy. I knew this person as dad. During World War II, my dad was in the Army. He was assigned as a military policeman. He told me of one episode where he was on a transport train, taking troops from one place to another. He was standing in the back of the train, just watching and seeing what was going on. And he noticed two soldiers across the aisle from each other starting to argue. The more they argued, the louder they got, and the more heated the argument. Dad decided it was time to start walking towards them to see what's going on. As he approached, one of the men clenched his fist and stood up. He had enough. He was about to hit the other man. My dad stood in front of him. This guy looked up, looked down at my dad. He said, oh, you do big. He sat back down. <laughs> the fight stopped before it even started. When I was 
was two years old, we bought our first home. My parents bought a modest house. We only had two bedrooms. And the upstairs, we were renting out to help pay for the mortgage. The problem was, there were three of us, my brother, sister, and myself, plus our parents. We couldn't go out to build, so the logical choice was to build a basement. But we didn't have any money, so Dad couldn't afford to hire a contractor. So what do we do? He did the logical thing. He went to the local hardware store. He bought a single shovel and a wheelbarrow. After a long day's work, Dad would come home, and he would take the wheelbarrow, put it by the side of the house, and he would start to shovel. He did this for months and months. No help. He managed to dig the ground underneath the house. He managed to put in the forms and build a basement. We now had an extra bedroom and a den. How he did this without collapsing the house, I'll never know. With my mom, they managed to build three companies. They started from scratch. They had nothing. With sheer willpower, determination, and hard work, they built a construction company, a real estate company, and they also built apartment complexes. When needed, Dad had no problem wielding his iron fist to manage these properties and these companies. But Dad also had a much softer side, a friendlier side. If you were nice to him, Dad would be nice to you, and he would treat you with respect. If you were a friend, there's nothing he wouldn't do for you. I remember a time when I was a teenager, Dad built a house for a couple, a young couple. Shortly after the home was built, they moved in. They ran into financial problems. They called Mom and Dad, asked if they could help. At this stage, Dad could have said, I built your home. I've done what I was asked to do. The bank has paid me. I'm done. Instead, they, my mom and dad agreed to meet with them, made financial arrangements, and the young couple were able to keep their home. Dad also had a soft side for myself, my brother, and my sister. He taught me many things. He taught me how to build a house from the ground up. He also taught me how to raise kids, my two children, from the ground up. He taught me a lot of life stories. For example, if you want to have nice things, you want a nice home, you want to have a nice car, all the trimmings that come with life, you want to go on vacations, you have to work for it. I remember many different things about Dad. Most of all, the way he taught me, when he'd teach me something like how to build a home, he would always talk about other things, about life. And at first, I would think, what are you talking about? But as I grew older, I started to understand what he was doing. He was telling me, yes, this is how you would physically do something, but this also works in life. This is how this, I can help you in life. It took me a while to figure this out, but I finally did. Paul Bunyan was a giant of a man. But I'll always remember my father as being an even bigger giant.